Um, beautiful. So I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so hello to everyone. I hope you've um, been enjoying the event this afternoon. And for those of you joining now, welcome. My name is Jenna Mulnerick, and I'm one of the Emerging Professionals in Digital Scholarship based in the Digital Scholarship Unit at UTSC Library. Uh, so today I'll be giving a short presentation around the creation of the DSU's Open Educational Resource Module Series, which we're very excited to be debuting in time for Open Ed Week. Uh, so with today's presentation, I want to describe the process of how the DSU has transformed some of its existing teaching materials. So these are all learning objects that were already created to some extent into a cohesive collection of learning modules that are openly licensed for both classroom and independent use. So I'll talk about how the project came to be and what it currently looks like, uh, describe the major steps that we took to transforming our modules, as well as some of the lessons learned while creating open content in a short time period. Uh, so the goal of this presentation is really to give you an idea of some of the different types of OER projects that are happening at U of T. As you're hopefully discovering in some of the breakout rooms, any, really any project can be transformed into an OER, OER project. Uh, the process that we used was specific to our project work at the DSU and by no means is something that you should feel you need to replicate step by step. Um, but hopefully some parts of our methods and timeline might be informative to designing your own materials. So just a bit of context on the Digital Scholarship Unit, or DSU for short. It's a group of librarians, system administrators, and application programmers within UTSC Library that are working with faculty to support digital scholarship at UTSC. Uh, so some of the many services that we offer are um, help with data and statistics, uh, support with software development, digital collections and archiving, as well as curriculum development to support digital pedagogy. Um, I joined the DSU in September and my primary role since then has been helping to make the digital learning resources that are developed by the DSU more accessible. So both within the library and as well as to the general public. Um, under the Did Digital Pedagogy Project, the DSU has been working on and off since 2014 to package and share some of the modules that we've developed as part of classroom instruction workshops or tutorials. Uh, these modules are focused on introductory topics in digital scholarship, such as metadata, data visualization, and writing and publishing for the web. We also have modules that focus on digital scholarship tools, such as Timeline and Story Maps, uh, OpenRefine, and Google Data Studio. So while the DSU has been working on different iterations of this project since 2014, the pandemic was actually a big push for us to redevelop our existing learning objects into a collection that could be openly accessed and licensed. So over the course of six or six months or so, we created an effective strategy for adapting all of our previously developed presentations, which we had just sitting in a Google folder on the DSU website and transforming them into an open series of modules that students could work through at their own pace and that faculty and librarians could adapt for teaching purposes if they so chose. Um, at the same time, we've also taken some steps to catalog the resources that we've built as well as the tools that they include so that we can sustain the continued development and uh, maintenance of the project over time. So we currently have 12 modules up on the website, 11 by the DSU and one by the bridge as well. Uh, the link for the collection is on the slide here, and if I could trouble um, Sarah, if she still has it, to pop it in the chat as well. Um, I have some screenshots, so no, no worries, but if you'd like to play around on the website, you're welcome to. Uh, once you're on the collection page, you can click on any module to open it, and it brings up the module as an embedded slide player. Um, all of this was done in Drupal. So from this platform, users can click through the slides in order or select titles, uh, the slides by title. They can also open the speaker's notes in a separate window, or they can just hit the view and download button, which will take them to the slides just from the regular Google slide interface. Um, so that's kind of what the project like, looks like at a high level. I'll get into some of the timeline and the steps that we took. Um, as I've mentioned a few times, this has been an ongoing process since 2014. What kickstarted this version of the project was a module review that was conducted in the summer of 2020. So this review was conducted as a practicum project uh, created by one of our liaison librarians, Paulina Russo, and taken up by uh, her student, Antoinette Fricassi. 
Uh, so the level was, uh, the review was intended to help refresh our high level understanding of the modules that we had. So as part of our project, Inchinada reviewed 30 modules that were all original presentations developed by the DSU and affiliate librarians. So she went through each of those from beginning to end and used a spreadsheet to capture important information about each module. So um, when the module was created, some of the overall themes and objectives, um, if any licenses were employed. And she also recorded um, any related documents, sample data, resources, or links, and uh, made a note of whether or not those needed to be updated. And then after walking through each module, she left us some notes and suggestions about the content and design, which was super helpful for organizing our approach and timeline to redesign the modules. The second thing that we decided to do was to format the brand, format and brand the modules a bit more consistently. So before we made any changes, I created one Google template in uh, one template in Google Slides to use for all of our presentations. And as part of this template, we settled on using an open license for all of our modules. We went with the, it's a mouthful, the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. And we went with this one for a few reasons. The first is that using this license does allow us to create open learning materials, which was one of the major goals for us with this project. Uh, we want to ensure first and foremost that anyone can use or adapt this material for learning purposes. Uh, the second reason that we went with it is that in our review process, we isolated that all of the modules that we had published, previous, published previously were also distributed under the same license. Uh, so this here is a copy of our attribution slide, which is used at the end of each presentation. Um, well, again, our content at the DSU is created by DSU librarians. All librarians do own their own pedagogical materials. And that ownership is something that we want to protect. So one of the conditions of this license is that anyone who adapts the work must also distribute their changes under the same license, uh, meaning that nobody can profit from adapting our materials once we put them out. Uh, the third reason is that it saves us from, uh, I guess, reinventing the wheel by giving us a bit more uh, time to develop the content, uh, because many of the introductory topics in digital scholarship that we go over include lots of repetitive definitions and tool walking, and it can be, again, quite repetitive and labor intensive to recreate it over and over again. So while these materials were all developed by DSE librarians, we can incorporate each other's work on individual presentations as long as it's properly attributed under the conditions of the license, which also includes describing any of the changes that we make to the original work. So now for the more fun part, which was implementing the actual changes. So this is an example of one of the first modules that we redesigned, which was originally created in 2017. So this module was about creating timelines for humanities research and demonstrating a timeline tool called Timeline.js. So we thought that this module had a lot of helpful foundational explanations for why you might make a timeline. Uh, but from the internet review process, we knew that it needed to have more examples and demonstrations for using the tool. Um, we also thought that it was a good classroom or workshop presentation, but some of the speakers notes were geared towards a particular group. So we got the sense that the instructor might have been doing examples for their one audience, but not necessarily capturing all of those um, activities as recorded details within the presentation. So it was hard for users to come in and follow what examples uh, were being outlined in the presentation. So what we did with it was after updating the theme, uh, we decided to keep the foundational explanations and then enhance them a bit more with our own demonstration of Timeline.js, which again is an open source timeline platform. Uh, so we took the story of the tortoise and the hare and we took a version published by the Library of Congress, which is in the public domain. And then we worked through isolating and sequencing all of the events within the story to format a timeline. So we went um, step by step through the process of taking a narrative text and then transforming it into a spreadsheet summary of events, um, timestamps, headlines, supporting details and illustrations all in the public domain. So we designed it as a build along as well so that every step that we had in the demonstration had accompanying notes and opportunities for reflection. Just gonna take a brief, quick sip of water. Um, so the process of updating the timeline module wound up being one of our biggest innovations in this iteration of the digital pedagogy project. So from the initial review stages, we noticed that a lot of the modules that needed 
that needed example data sets, it was really challenging to find clear open data sets that were intuitive to follow and that would resonate across different disciplines. Uh, we also knew from past experience that when we would go into digital tool teaching, students would easily get distracted by discipline specific examples for data sets and statistics. Uh, so instead of trying to find an open data set for each potential module or for each potential audience, we really wanted to take the opportunity to create a data set uh, for our tutorials that would be relatively uh, comprehensible across both disciplinary and cultural boundaries. Um, so our idea for a data set is was to create a data set structured around text and illustrations of Aesop's fables. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, Aesop's fables are a collection of short stories for children that come from the ancient Greek storyteller Aesop. Um, they're usually under a page in length. And we wanted to use this set of children's stories in the public domain, because even if people don't know them from their childhood, they're very easy to understand in their entirety. So that kind of allows us to separate the complexity of the content um, with how and why we're using a certain tool. So since the data set is based around a common narrative that we can easily relay and dissect, we can also use that text and data combination to unpack some critical thinking skills like organization, narration, and visualizing data. So the data set includes different types of data points, such as text, images, geolocations, timestamps, uh, different file types like CSV files, PDFs, and audiovisual files. All of the content is either created by us or by materials in the public domain. So here's one quick example of repurposing the data set for, diff for different modules. Uh, these images are from our digital storytelling story maps module, which demonstrates another open source tool called story maps, uh, where users can create maps that you can navigate using real locations. So this module, again, had a lot of foundational concepts describing digital storytelling. So we expanded on that uh, by filling in our text uh, image files and geolocations from our data set and then creating a map around the story of the tortoise and the hare. Uh, this last step is one that goes towards sustainability of the project. And it's something that we did in parallel as we were developing the modules. And it's a bit more technical because we're the DSU, so no, no need to feel that it needs to be repeated. But one of our goals with this project is, and with the digital pedagogy project more largely, is to create a directory of digital scholarship tools and resources that are available on the general web. Uh, which we eventually want to plan uh, to turn into a searchable knowledge base for public use. So for this project, we've had librarians across UTSC contribute names and links to their favorite digital pedagogy resources, and, and just which could be uh, web development tools, online collections, or learning resources. And then we then had two practicum students, Aaron Tanner and Caroline Butt, describe and categorize the resources by theme. And they were able to get through, I think, 300 entries in three months, which was really great in pushing this project forward. Um, so as part of their projects, they reviewed each tool and gave it a brief description and then identified what costs and licensing were associated for, with the resources, as well as what you would need to operate the tool and what types of digital scholarship work you might use it for. And then we also had a computer science co-op student, uh, Tanmay Gupta, who built a Google script to allow us to control multiple entries in our database, uh, which I've captured here. So we decided to incorporate the learning modules into the knowledge base workflow by adding all of the completed modules and learning materials to our knowledge base, as well as any tools in the modules. So for example, uh, this module about writing and publishing for the web has a lot of references to blogging platforms and projects. So we added each one of these tools to the knowledge, to the knowledge base and described them based on uh, what you can do with the technology. And then at the same time, we also use the knowledge base to feed content back into the module. So after this writing and publishing module was finished, we use the knowledge base to comb through all of the publishing platforms that we described. And then we use that information to make a comparison chart between different types of blogging platforms that we put at the end of the presentation. So for other modules, we use the knowledge base to help point users to related materials, again, usually as a slide at the end of the presentation. Uh, the knowledge base also works really well for us for establishing upkeep because we can easily identify which tools are used for each module and then update content across modules if it's something that we need to do. Uh, so that was an overview of all of our process. So I'll go into just briefly some of the lessons that we learned. Um, we found that the review process that was done by Antoinetta and Paulina was really key in helping us organize the project. 
So first of all, the review process helped us determine which tools we wanted to turn into OER and whether it was worth our time to update it. Uh, some of the presentations were great, but they relied really heavily on tools that didn't exist anymore, or they might have worked really well for a presentation in person, but would you'd have to scrap them and build them from scratch to do it for an online audience. Um, our time for updating the modules was about seven months after the review, and of course, our first priority is always to do something right the first time. Um, but we did want to maximize our output as best as we could, given the context of the pandemic and working online and all of that. Uh, the review also really helped us see some of the overlap between our existing content. So of the 30 modules that were reviewed, there were some that covered different aspects of the same topic or tool, and we were able to condense those a bit. And then there were others that we decided to just keep an archive as they were. So of the 30 that we started with, we narrowed them down into 20 modules that we thought were worthwhile as OER. And then looking at the review a bit more holistically, we decided to schedule a module redesign around the types of updates that the modules needed. So the first group were modules that required largely technical updates, which were like straightforward changes that we could fit in whenever we had time. Uh, so technical updates for us included things like updating broken links, uh, replacing tutorials or instructions if they were out of date, adjusting how the slides looked, things like that. Uh, the second were modules that needed major pedagogical changes, um, which for us included restructuring the content for the appropriate audience, introducing new content, and then creating new demonstrations and data that we could use and distribute within the context of our license. Uh, we scheduled our updates for the modules depending on what kind of work needed to be done. So for example, a technical heavy module we would do one week and then a pedagogical heavy one we do the next. Uh, some types of updates wound up being a 50-50 split once we dug into them, so that required a bit more flexibility on our part once we'd gotten started. Um, once we did get started with it, we thought that reviewing OER conditions was actually one of those middle ground tasks because we did want to assess and use and credit all of our materials properly, uh, which required both research and link updates. Uh, but overall, the structure worked really well for us because we were able to get through a lot of content without feeling that it was repetitive or starting to get burnt out. Um, but just a few more lessons from this project. Uh, something I really wanted to part is starting low tech. Um, I personally coming into the project was really overwhelmed by the thought of creating OER and doing it um, like responsibly, but really a lot of OER projects can, a lot of projects can be OER projects and the easier it is to start them, I think the easier it is to finish them as well. So OER also doesn't have to be like the flashiest platform or something that you design entirely from the ground up. Um, in our case, it was adapting our content in Google Slides and then tracking our content in Google Spreadsheets. And that ease of creation in that sense helped us focus our energies on other aspects of the project. Uh, the second lesson for us is that strategy is definitely our friend. Uh, the most labor intensive part of this project, in my opinion, was the evaluation process, which was deciding and justifying based on the review, what we wanted to adapt and then conceptually creating the new materials. Actually updating the content and getting it OER ready in terms of crediting work came, I think, a lot more easily and a lot more naturally as we went on. So if you're able to come up with a plan that suits um, like front loading some of that decision making into your process early on, that makes it a lot easier in the long run. Uh, the last lesson we really learned was to take advantage of using the license wherever we could. Um, so for our tool teaching, we really wanted to create data examples that were easy for students to grasp and that worked for a variety of contexts. Uh, so once we had that going for us, we took full advantage of adopting and citing materials that had emerged from bits and pieces of our collective work. Uh, so the data set itself is also something that we intend to publish under the same license once all the modules are up. And then the same goes for the database. So having that ongoing record of digital scholarship tools that we can sort by topic and by purpose uh, really helped us when it came to designing the modules and then having an efficient way to keep track of changing technologies. Uh, so our next step with the digital pedagogy project more largely is to take the knowledge base from an internal to an external database. And we also hope that this database is something that can be helpful for libraries to build similar open ed projects because most of the tool research will be there for them to use in the same way that we've used it. Um, from a resource standpoint, it also helps maintain the project in the long term because now that that high level thinking is captured and cemented, we can easily look back at our records and update content as we need to or bring more people into the project and give them the context they need. 
Uh, we do have some related documentation for this project out on GitHub, and I understand that there will be a lot more to follow as well. So ah, that's it for me. I guess my final words are keep it low tech to start, um, generate examples with broad understanding if you can, and review early. I'm happy to take any questions about the project, or um, I'll put up my email as well if anyone wants to talk to me directly. I'm seeing lots of thanks, Jenna, and, and I'll just reiterate that thanks. This is the work that you and, and everyone on this project have put in. I think we, we've definitely seen some amazing results and it's just, I, I looking back to what we started with and when I looked at the page just this morning, I was like, wow, this is, a, this is just beautiful work. Are there any questions for Jenna before we move on? Okay, seeing nothing. I'm going to stop the recording.